Ed O'Brien is the innovative guitar player from Radiohead. He just released a solo album in the middle of a pandemic. I caught up with him at his home in London and we spoke on Zoom about his solo album, his life from Radiohead and the culture that's getting him through these times. first place I sort of headed to at night was obviously the Hacienda in 87 and going to like one of the, was it called, was there a night called Zumba or the temp and the temperance club and they were half empty and I couldn't believe it kind of like, and then of course a year later it was different story, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. I, I mean, I was, I, you know, I, I feel like a bit of a zealot. I was so lucky to be, you know, a southerner coming to oh, all I want to do coming from Oxford which is this very academic city that had very interesting duality to it because, of course, it had the car works, which was a really important part to the, mm. the identity of the city. But there was no music scene. And I was in this fledgling band, which was Radiohead, different name, but school band. And all I wanted to do was go to a great music city. Mm. And it, had to, it was always going to be Manchester, you know. Well, what was great about Manchester, no one cared that you came from Oxford. It's not everyone yeah. Got- yeah. yeah, and I love that. And I, I remember literally little things like the first day going to get some chips and gravy. I'd never had chips and gravy. And, and the woman behind the counter saying love to me. I'm like, I love that. <laughs> and also another big thing, having an Irish surname. Like in Oxford, there was not a big Irish community at all. It was very, very, you know, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. And then going to Manchester, where every other person is, seems to be of Irish heritage. Every musician virtually has an Irish backdrop. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so for this interview here, I mean, it's, I was kind of going to do stuff about what you're doing during the lockdown. Well, yeah. Let's nice talk about your album as well, actually. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so, um, I mean, they're just, they're just, the album itself sounds great. It's a great headphone Thank record. You. Yeah, Thank so, you. And obviously spent a lot of time tweaking everything. But um, the gestation of it is quite interesting because it goes back well, I suppose in a way it goes back to almost the beginning of uh, Radiohead and on a Friday and right back to the beginning of everything. Your role in that band, your relationship to the other band members and finding a space for your creativity. And I've read some interviews somewhere. I mean, in a sense, it's like you, you're like the George Harrison in Radiohead. So in a way, in a weird way, if we're going to be very convoluted, <laughs> more, uh, all things must pass kind of splurge out. Yeah, I, it's funny. It's funny when you say about George Harrison. He was always—he was the one I was first aware of. Like my dad was a big George Harrison fan and John Lennon, so I was aware of George Harrison. I had that George Harrison's greatest hits before I even heard the Beatles. That one where he's on the front of a hot rod, sitting there with a floppy hat. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a—you know, like I've been trying to. People said, "Oh, why now?" And I don't really know why now. I think, I think you know, if you're in a band like Radiohead. It's such a sort of fertile and creative place. And for me, and it was all consuming as well. And, you know, Tom made his first record in, he recorded it in 2004, uh, The Eraser. And in 2004, our firstborn, my eldest son was born. And then for me, it was something when the kids were born and being a dad, that sort of took over. And any free time that I had, I just wanted to be present and be with them because you know, but I guess biology kicked in and it was just that I recognized that this moment with them being these little souls running around your ankles and stuff was, was such a fleeting moment. And I found it such a, such an amazing time, but also, I mean, it was, I, I think probably like people when, when you're first children born, it's also a really challenging time. There's nothing like little children to hold up a mirror to your weaknesses or insecurities. That's what sleep deprivation does. And for me, I'm ever thankful because, you know, for want, for want of a better word, it, it helped me to sort my shit out. Mm-hmm. And so this all kind of started, you know, I guess way back in, you know, I don't know exactly, but in terms of when the, the music started to be written, it was suddenly when the kids were old enough, you know, they were eight and six, and we took some time out and went, you know, went to live in Brazil. Um, because my wife and I, my, my, mother's, my wife's mother's family are from South America. Um, we love South America. We love that culture. I love Brazilian music. And I sort of went from that thing of like, I sort of woke up in the middle of the noughties and went, hang on a sec, I've been dealt this incredible card, you know, hand, in, you know, set of cards. 
I have an obligation to go out and live it fully. So why not take your little family and go and live in Brazil? So that's kind of where it started. And it, it, it I had space, I had time, um, and I felt inspired. So, yeah, were you writing with a laptop? Were you, were you playing everything yourself? Or were you, were you collaborating, sparking ideas off? Or was it purely every single instrument from the gestation album is just pure, purely you? Yeah, it was just me. And, and uh, it started off with a laptop, but I don't like working on computers. So then what happened was I put the computer away because I was essentially doing quite electronic stuff. I was using Ableton Live and Pro Tools and manipulating sounds and making using a keyboard. And, and I just wasn't getting off on it. And all I really wanted to do was my old Martin acoustic in the corner. That's what I really wanted to do. But I, I was sort of, I guess I was, I was, I felt like a little bit handcuffed because I was in that place where I thought that I should be doing something electronic. And because, you know, I come from a place that's always wanting to push sonic boundaries and be on the frontier. And I felt that's where the frontier of sound, you know, sound is in electronic music, but it wasn't where my heart was wanted to be. And that for me was the big lesson to kind of this whole, this whole record is like, well, what do I really want to do? What is my truth? What am I really feeling here? Not what I should be doing. And I think that's, if anything, you know, that's, a re- that's, that's kind of the artistic impulse is to follow your intuition, let your intuition, your inspiration be your guide rather than the mental side, which goes, I, you know, I should be doing this. So the moment I let go, I started picking up the acoustic guitar and then I went into a studio in Oxfordshire with a fantastic engineer produced called Ian Davenport. And that's when we demoed and I did all the playing, all the bass, the singing, the guitars, the keyboards and, and, and then to, to, I didn't know how, what this, I was just literally following up. I, I want to build these songs up. I don't know what will happen. I'm, I wasn't even thinking about releasing them. I just knew I had to do it. It was completely compelling. And I also knew that I didn't, you know, I was aware that I could very, I could just do this as my own thing for me. It didn't have to be, you know, there's this thing, if you're a musician and you do it professionally in inverted commas, there's almost like this obligation that people feel that they have to release it to the wider world. Well, why do you, you know, you don't, if you, if it's, if it, if it, if it, if you get it and you're enjoying it and you might think that other people don't, well, don't release it. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, we don't have to release music. It can be like, you know, like our grandparents who had hobbies, (laughs) you know, and did things for the pure love of them. Right. Well, with music, they would play pianos at home. Yeah. Yeah, my grandfather was a, he was an osteopath by trade, but he was also a great joiner, loved woodworking, fly, fly fisherman and singing in a choir, you know, <laughs> yeah. and he didn't try and sell his fly, he didn't try and sell his work. But, you know, I, I'm a real believer in that, like those, you've got to have things in your life that aren't necessarily going to further you as an artist or whatever. They're, actually, those things are, they're at the heart of what makes you happy and and you know, being a happy person on this planet. It's interesting the way you talk about the music you're making for the album, because one of the first things that struck me, which was quite fascinating, is that normally when you get a, a, re- a pretty big group and people make the solo records, it's like them, like you initially were trying to do, is trying to get the weird stuff out or the stuff you can't quite get to, into the mothership because it's just a bit too uh, wacky. But it's the other way around. Yeah. The, the mothership's the wacky one. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember the last time I went to see Radiohead when you played in Manchester at the, at the, um, at the cricket grounds. Yeah. This, this sounds like a band that sh- should be making sessions to the Mark Ryder show, playing to 50 <laughs> people in the Northern Quarter, but somehow you're playing 50,000 people in the field and they're all going on the trip, which is an amazing achievement. But yeah. when you make your solo record, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not more conventional, but it's more like a pop record than the, yeah. the big band. Well, I think that's interesting because you're absolutely spot on. And I feel like that. The easiest thing in many ways is for me to make a record in the vein of Radiohead. That's kind of like I use my, I use art as, a, as, a, as an analogy. I think, I think Radiohead is like, it's like impressionist painting. You know, you get kind of, it's, it's, it's sort of like high art in a way. You get a, a feeling from it, but it's very... It's very, uh, there's a beauty to it, but it's, it's, it's not very direct. I, having spent time in Brazil 
and I was really influenced by a lot of those uh, big uh, graffiti artists in Sao Paulo, people like Cobra. And they're vibrant and they're these huge, you know, it's artworks for the people and it's direct and it's joyful and it's, and that's what I wanted to do. And for me, the hardest thing was to make something really direct because Radiohead haven't been making direct records for years. You know, probably the last one we made was maybe In Rainbows, but the most direct record we made was The Benz, our second record. And then it all became more, and I, you know, I love that, but, and my conversations with Flood when, you know, as a producer, like, because we, be we became mates before we worked together, was our love of pop. And, you know, I know I've had this conversation with you and I've had this conversation with Johnny Ma that I feel like, you know, one of the reasons I love Manchester music so much is this pop with psychedelia. And I think that's what my record, my record, when I'm, tr when I'm trying to like all the colors, the layers, to me, it's like the magical realism of South America. It's vibrant, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's psychedelic. And, you know, you, I, I love Gabriel Garcia Marquez as a writer and that the, 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 the invisible world, the world of spirit and the world of, of, of reality. And that's kind of where I wanted to be. So I wanted that directness, but I wanted almost like this kaleidoscope of color and textual psychedel psychedelia for want of a better word. So yeah, I was, I, 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 that was a very, very deliberate uh, move on my part because actually it's the hardest thing to do. Actually to, you know, in Radiohead the process can be one of lots and lots of layers and we've got layers on my record, but a lot of it when it came down to the mixing was pulling stuff out. How direct can we be? Mm -hmm. So that was, that felt more of it. That felt I was out of my comfort zone, whereas my comfort zone is much more, you know, the Radiohead way in a way. So yeah. uh, more nuanced, that, textural. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, so the, the challenge was to be direct, more direct, and and pop. And you know, Flood and I bonded over. You know, we were so we've been so lucky to grow up in this era of of certainly in the seventies and the eighties when, you know. Coming, I'm born in 68, so my first memories of Top of the Pops are literally 73, 74, all the greats, the Bowies and, you know, Slade. And, but then all the things like, you know, coming of age and, and owning Top of the Pops, you know, when you're about 78, 79, and one week there's, you know, you've got Bill Withers next to Talking Heads, next to Baccarat, Yes Sir, I Can Boogie. I loved it all. You know, it was all good. It was all great music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, I mean, maybe that's another great thing about Manchester. There was never, that's it. Tony Wilson always said about the greatest record collections, which is a great quote. Also, there's no highbrow or lowbrow in Manchester. It's a great place to come to as an 18, 19 year old student because it is the kind of place you go to a club and you would hear Baccarat and then you'd hear the yeah. Smiths and it was all mixed together and it all made yeah. sense, didn't it? It was revolutionary to me and I loved it because, you know, where I came from in Oxford, it could all get a bit like, you know, the taste police could, you know, if you weren't in the right man, you know, and it was very interesting, Oxford, because Oxfordshire was very, very white. So we didn't have, you know, the influence of Moss Side and, you know, the Caribbean community, the black community in Manchester. So we were very much like, you know, it was, it was great in one way, you know, I was in the kind of the semi-goth camp and the Susie and the Bauhaus thing, but God forbid if you listen to, I didn't hear Led Zeppelin until I literally, I never heard a Led Zeppelin album until I was 25 mm. because Led Zeppelin were those boys on motorbikes that, you know, what we used to call the doities. And they were like, you know, they were long haired denim jackets into Quo and Zeppelin. And it's like Motet and that, you know, but Manchester was, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was more of a melting pot, right? Yeah. Which, which uh, coming back to your record, I can hear it in your record because it, when you listen to it, you can still hear that Brazilian thing in there. I mean, it's not right. it become the Brazilian record, but I can hear some of the rhythms in there. But it's also a very English record as well. This, with your voice, with your guitar yeah. playing, it's classic English style, but uh, but also very future as well. It, I mean, we were saying about what I said a minute ago about uh, Radiohead being, you know, more left field, etc. Ironically, but there's something. It's it's not a traditional record. Your record sounds like it's 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 kind of made next year, not this year. Are well, these all aspects yeah. that you were aware of, or are these just things that just, just sort of happened? They just do. I like the Brazilian influence. I was really influenced by being in Brazil and rhythm and going to carnival and stuff like that. And that's, you know, going to carnival, it's the greatest show. It was, it was a kind of a, 
it was a eureka moment. It was like, whoa, the energy. It was a, very similar to, not too dissimilar to the greatest rave on, on, on earth, not too dissimilar, very similar in feeling to, you know, a great night in Shangri-La in Glastonbury. There's definitely common ground. And that's a, you know, for one of better, better word, that's about the love and the light and the, you know, the, 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 the kind of, the, you know, the, the existential thing that people have been doing this for thousands of years and coming together and dancing and celebrating and at certain times of the year. So there's that. But like the, 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 the English side of it, and for me, it's a very, I got really drawn when we were out living in Brazil. I suddenly started, because I, I originally come from the countryside. I come from West Oxfordshire, very near a place called Uffington, mm. which is where the White Horse Hill is. And it's a very, very old part of Britain. And, you know, the, the Ridgeway runs along there. Avebury's just down the road. And I always loved it. I always felt a sense of, you know, there's this, the Ridgeway. If you go on the Ridgeway, like in November, December, you go for a walk and it's blowing. I, I, I loved it. There was a wildness. And when we were out, I, I'd lived in cities. So I lived in Manchester and I went to, back to Oxford and I lived in London. I'd been in cities about 25 years, suddenly living remotely. And I started craving this countryside. British countryside, wild British countryside, but also, and again, I don't know why, Celtic. I was just like, I remembered like, because we used to go to Ireland a lot when we were kids, and I used to love coming to Wales, and I've been up to Scotland a couple of times, but there's something about the mountains, the valleys, and the hills. And so when we got back, I was just, again, I'm in total intuition mode. I'm like, where do I want to go on this? Because for me, location's really important like writing and inspiration and immediately headed out to mid wales to the elam valley and uh we, we we well we'd actually that summer we came back from so we rented a cottage on a farm with the kids uh in the elam valley and it was amazing and i came back and wrote there and there's something in this land here there's something in this place and i actually talked to robert plant a bit about this because robert uh has his house on the other side of the mountain and him and jimmy page wrote a lot of all the acoustic stuff. And it's so interesting because for me, like, you know, I didn't really know uh, Led Zeppelin, but hearing the acoustic stuff and being in this place, it's something like, oh my God, this is the sound of this place. So as this was a place I came to write to, these kind of, these guitar things, these arpeggios, they just sort of came out. And so what I was interested in was, what, what, these, the, the two places I was inspired by was this kind of dance and almost like trance of of carnival and uh, and this kind of very folk old british uh something that feels like it's from the ground from the earth and so that's literally what i was trying to do in the song brazil is literally i mean if you want to reduce it to its bare bare parts it's the first part is very welsh it's acoustic five four and then it goes into this four four kind of basically trance kind of that's what i was trying to do so um yeah, it's a very, um, yeah. it's a very wide, on paper, it's very wide, isn't it? From the, the amazing day glow, colourful Brazilian carnival culture and that, that beautiful, dark, grey, melancholy of, of the yeah. Welsh Valleys. But somehow you kind of crammed it all together. <laughs> That's great. Well, I, I think, and also I was, there's the, the theme that, it was interesting, the theme, so if there's a, if there's a, a spiritual theme to the record, it's really about coming out of the darkness into the light. When I was in Brazil, I, I used to listen to a lot of music. And one day I was, uh, you know, every day, like a good British guy, I'd have my tea break at 11 o'clock, have a cup of tea, and I'd listen to some music. And I'm, in, I'm next to a lake, and it's very Brazilian and very rural and very beautiful and tropical. And I put on uh, Scream Adelica, Primal Scream. And it was like, I got the spine tingle, up, you know, and I was like, oh my God. And, you know, it's that first song and the first song on there's uh, Moving On Up. And I, re I didn't realize at the time quite what it was that, I, mean, I thought there are many aspects to that record that I love, you know, s musically, it's so diverse. But I think actually what I was really responding to is that's essentially it's kind of like a gospel record because the theme of the of that record is out of the dark into the light. You know, that's soul, that's gospel. And for me, that legitimized exactly how I was feeling. That's on a, on a, on a, on a personal journey through my life, 
but also what I was seeing in the world, like we're in this place of crisis and that I, I feel that there are shards of light coming through. There, there are moments of light and these important things to, 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 to focus on. So I was aware of that kind of that darkness, being in the darkness, but, 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 but looking to the light and feeling the light and feeling moments of light. Is this personal darkness, the depression that you had? And was it was going to yeah. be trying to get over that depression? It was, it's, it's a long process. I think the thing with depression is that it's a long process. And, you know, everybody's depression slightly is different. And, you know, I, I for years didn't acknowledge that I was depressed because what should I be depressed about? I can't, you know, I come from a, you know, nice middle class family uh, in, in Oxford. Uh, you know, we weren't, we weren't rich, but we never had to, you know, we never had to ask for anything. You know, we, we never, you know, there's always food on the table. Um, so it was a, it was a, I couldn't allow, but I was deeply unhappy, you know, and I think it's interesting, like there's, this is a whole other discussion as well, but like, I know there's the classic route and I've spoken to Johnny about this, like, you know, in Britain, the, the, the great musical journey is one of the working class hero. Mm. And, you know, and I, t and, and it's a beautiful story. Of course it is. It's an absolute, it's a fantastic story, elevating yourself out of the situation and, and, you know, but there's also another interesting story which never gets spoken about. And it's a, it's the middle class story. And, you know, for those of us, the, you know, the middle classes, if you're brought up in them, they can be so emotionally, uh, what's the word? They, 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 it's like a stranglehold on your emotions, you know, like that, that kind of Terry and June-esque kind of, you know, that kind of middle class thing that was in abundance in the 50s, 60s and 70s and all the passive aggression and nobody says what they mean and there's all this stuff underneath the surface. And, and as a child, children are so sensitive to all this stuff and, you know, and you're being told bullshit and you know it and it is all bullshit. So for me, there was a whole load of, you know, it's a load of, ch uh, you know, parents' divorces, all that stuff, growing up in an unhappy childhood, all that stuff basically leads to depression and, and yeah, and, and the, the whole thing going to, Brazil, going to Brazil was after that. But it's, you know, it's, it's when you, in about 2001, I was like on top of the world. I'm like, we just made Kid A or we just made, you know, it was actually just after we made OK Computer. And, you know, we were being recognized for being this band that was doing something good. And I could buy a terraced house in Oxford. You know, it was brilliant. But why am I so unhappy? Why am I more unhappy? And then you know, it's just a classic journey that so many people have on. And that's when you start looking inwards and you start sorting your shit out. So yeah, it was that journey is coming kind of finally finding a place like in 2012, I'd never been happier. You know, it, it felt like my life was going up, up and up and up towards the light. So it was great. The song, the song Shangri-La obviously references Shangri-La in Glastonbury, which is, which is a heart really is these days, the heart of Glastonbury. But also yeah. is about you finding a personal Shangri-La with, you know with that depression totally mm. yeah that's exactly it it's about a journey it's about journeys and it's about journeys that i, I wanted that, that that thing like you know i think so many people are on these journeys and it seems that you know these journeys have been made for for thousands of years on the wall over there there's you know joseph campbell the hero with a thousand faces this is a saint john of the cross talks about the dark night of the soul you know and and these are these are things that we've, these are, these are, these are things, journeys we've all been on, we've all go on. And for me, I just wanted to make that kind of music that, 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 yeah, I had to sort of express it in a way. And Shangri-La seemed perfect because I'm never happier than at four o'clock in the morning in the middle of Shangri-La and you're with your tribe, right? You know? <laughs> it's, it's, I'm thinking with the album, it's, it's a very Glastonbury record. You know that thing? When you walk around Glastonbury, um, yeah, it's a, it, it is the best festival. No matter what grumpy old men my age say about it, it's the fun. <laughs> it? it's, it's music from all over the world. You're walking around. You got you got sort of grime in one ear, Dead Kennedys in another, African music in another, uh, techno blasting out of a tent another, and, and your record sort of captures that eclecticism, but makes it. It's not chopped together. It's not a bricolage record, but somehow yeah. it finds that look finds the main path in Glastonbury. I mean, is, is, is there a sense that this is a very much of a Glastonbury kind of record? Because I mean, obviously yeah. part of the Glastonbury story, three headlines on the pyramid stage, etc. 
Yeah, I mean, that's really great. That's so great that you say that because I feel like, you know, every time I go to, and we, I, we, me and my wife go to Glastonbury every year. Um, so it's kind of our carnival. It's the, it's the time when I always feel like, you know, you're reunited with your tribe. I had a great, um, a friend's dad is in his 80s. <laughs> and about six years ago, and he was one of the, he was, he helped Michael Evis and all that crew set it up in 1970. And he sort of turns up at the gates and they let him in. And I was, I was in Shangri-La about five years ago with, uh, with his friend's father called David. And he's in his mid 80s. And, you know, it's, it's in the middle of, it's, it's like four o'clock in the morning. And I turned to him and I said, David, I said, I said, what is it about this place? What, you know, it feels, I said to him, because it always takes around, around midsummer. I said, it feels like we've been doing this, human beings have been doing this, celebrating midsummer for thousands of years. And he said, he said, Ed, it's the meeting of the tribes of the north, the tribes of the south and the east and the west. Mm. And I was just like, yeah. And, and, and yeah, so for me, the, there's something, you know, you c- I used to dismiss it as like, you know, the, like the largest party for four or five days. But it feels more than that. It feels it's, it's, it's in a very, you know, Billy Bragg was, you know, he calls it Albion. It's in this very old part of England. Mm. Um, and again, you know, Glastonbury is a very significant uh, historical place, a lot of history there. The land is, is interesting. Um, and it's in midsummer and it's, you know, it feels like we're tapping into something that is, that is universal that we, you know, there's almost bigger than we can kind of comprehend. Does, does, that it makes sense. does it sometimes feel that it's been going on longer than 1970? <laughs> yeah, totally. I, that's, that's the, for me that that's the thing that like, you know, I had a friend who came who'd never been to Glastonbury and he's um old school friend and he came when we headlined uh, when we played in 2017 and I got him and his wife tickets and they went fully immersed in it and he's a he's he's a, he's a really academic bright guy you know got a got a masters of philosophy from Oxford and all that and he he's big shakespeare head and he 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 was he was knocked out and his thing is he said it's like a midsummer night's dream. This is a midsummer's night dream, and I was just like, "Yeah, of course." You know, there is an aspect of that. You know, that it's it's old, it's old, and it's all. And I, it's it's more than just. You know, it's the greatest music festival, as you said. Then there's there there some. I think there are reasons about it that we don't fully comprehend, but you feel it, right? I, I so, think. Yeah. I think what Nick and Emily have done the last few years has been quite amazing because. It could have easily coasted on as being like an old brand and, you know, could have had Led Zeppelin headline, which would have been fantastic. Yeah. And you can have Led Zeppelin if you can get them to play together again. It would be ace. But on the Sunday, you'd have something that only, you'd have Stormzy headlining. It's yeah. kind of future and past all mixed together at the same time, isn't it? I, I think it's brilliant. And I think particularly like the way that, you know, um, I, for me last year, the big one was Dave. Dave on that, on the other stage, we were walking past and I didn't, I know that my kids knew Dave and my son, I think, been to a Dave gig. And I watched this, I watched this unfold and I saw that moment, that great moment when he gets the kid up on stage and they do that Tiago Silva song. Mm. And I was just like, fuck, this is great. And as you said, Nick and Emily have steered it like, you know, you've got, you've got Stormzy headlining, you've got artists like Dave. I think Stormzy played in 2017 when we were playing on the other stage. And they really, and, and they're obviously also, they're obviously really aware of uh, female representation as well, which is, which is obviously so important. So there's this, yeah, they're, they're brilliant. They've taken it on and it's, yeah, I just wish, it's a shame. I bet like everybody wishes more people could experience it. That's the only thing, you know, there are a lot of people who probably don't understand the effects of Glastonbury, you know, who, you know, maybe a load of inner city kids who actually, you put them in that environment and they go, whoa, this is, a, you know, it's an ex- amazing thing to experience. Yeah, because it's because it's a bit like Manchester in '89. Everybody's welcome, and it? it's like yeah, I'm sure like inner city kids will think it's it's kind of sort of like some very middle class festival, but it's not really because a lot of the acts aren't really that middle class. Are they? they're all classes? It's all everybody's in there in the melting pot. 
Yeah, and that's what I love. It's like, you know, when you come from the middle classes, you, you know, and you're in the music industry, you spent 30 years being apologetic from where you came. And it's so nice to go somewhere. Like, it's not fucking important where you, you know, I think it was Ian Brown who said that. Didn't he say that in 89? He got that from Bob Marley. It's not where you're from, it's where you're at. Mm, yeah. You know, was it Muhammad Ali's ring man in the boxing? No, well, that was the other quote, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a great quote, isn't it? Like Ian, yeah. Ian was always great at those eight word t shirt quotes, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah brilliant and it was just like yeah all right i can feel good about coming from oxford <laughs> or it doesn't matter that i came from oxford i'm here now yeah yeah i, I think it was always a, a london media obsession more than for anybody else in the country nobody 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 else really cares that much do they yeah i don't know i yeah i guess it, i guess it was it i guess it was it was it was the who was the fella? Um, there were the two at the NME, the, the famous writer, the the, the, the couple. Um, um, uh, Judy so, Birchall and, and yeah, Parsons. Tony, yeah, Tony Parsons. Yeah, they were kind of probably exemplified that. In a way. Anyway, you know, yeah, it was it was refreshing to get to Manchester. Mm. <laughs> so, so Radiohead. Uh, I mean, some bands when people go off and make uh, their own records, like Tom's major records, you're making your records. The people are goes, mm, there's, there's cracks appearing. They're all, they're obviously like a lot of tensions, but it seems to work in Radiohead the way around. Is it? It sort of sort of sort of adds adds to the process of the bands because you you work in a very different way than most bands. There's space for everybody in your in your group, isn't there? Yeah, totally. And I think it should. I mean, I would take it even a step further, and it's not being discussed. But I think the idea of it being like a I've always, we've always, we've always kind of kicked against the kind of the, that classic band model. You know, when at the time of OK Computer, people, you know, everyone was saying, oh, they're the heir apparent to you too. And, you know, it's that, that you get, you know, you go in, you, you're doing arenas now. Now the next step is you make a, you make a OK Computer part two, or you make, you know, OK Joshua Tree or, you know Joshua Computer. You know, and you go and you're playing stadiums, and you know, much as I, I was a huge fan of you two back in the day, but that was never our route, and it was much more, it was more a case of well, what would Bowie do? You know, it was much more looking to to try and do make these left turns, um, or and it, and it actually it wasn't even trying to make left turns. It was trying to. It was like where's the inspiration? You know, so. For us, it's always been about how are you inspired and, you know, and being truthful about that, not fulfilling a contract, not feeling like you should do or you ought to. It's because you really are inspired to work with these other people. It's very, very simple when you get down to it. And so, yeah, the, the, the other the solo projects are really, really important. And I think, you know, you've got to be realistic that bands change over time. You know, from we were signed at the end of 91 and we we had three months off in 98, but we carried on until the end of 2003 and then took all of 2004 off, had a year off. But that was pretty full on. And we don't, we haven't, since then, we haven't worked in the same way. It's just not possible. You know, when, you know, you have families, so the nature of bands change. You're not a gang anymore. You're not, and we were never a kind of a street gang, but, you know, you spend so much time together. You have so many shared experiences, but we don't anymore, mm. you know. But there's nothing to be fearful about there. There's nothing to go, oh, I mean, it's like, it's natural. And I, I, I always feel like, the, the, in a way, the model should really be more like a jazz band. That you didn't expect Miles Davis's band, you know, Herbie Hancock, that, that era of In a Silent Way, Herbie Hancock and all that, like John McLaughlin, to always be playing with Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. But that would be nuts because they're not inspired. You know, they have a moment, they come together. So that for me, and I think that's for all of us, it's that thing make records when you're truly inspired because that's when the music that's when the music will work for you if you do it because you feel you should do again it's that should thing don't fucking do it mm. don't 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 bother you know it's it's like we've got one life and do the best you can and and i, I think people you know and i understand that and i don't judge other bands for it you know for 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 you know they get worried their career and stuff like that i totally get it and i guess we're lucky that We've never felt that kind of pressure of maintaining a career. And actually, what's interesting, the least you give a fuck about the career, the more people seem to kind of like it. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask that. You, 
<laughs> you're surprised that people come on this trip. Like I was saying about that gig at Old Trafford at the cricket ground. Yeah. Packed to the back with the kind of people who never who never really normally listen to that kind of music, but they came on the trip. And so when you go, when you make the records, and I, I'm sure most people just want you to be um a rock band with a little arty edge, but you just went completely in the direction into like this kind of almost ambient um deconstructed electronic music, which is wonderful. I mean, but what how you must have been thought, wow, this is still number one in America. How did that happen? Because, yeah, God bless them in America, but it isn't the sort of place you expect those records to be stadiums, isn't it? Well, I remember the guy, I did an interview with a guy from Billboard, the trade mag in America at the time of Kid A, and Kid A was our first number one album in America. And he said, he said, I've got to tell you, man, Kid A is the weirdest number one record I've ever heard in America. I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Kid A was the big moment. I mean, I think, we lost some people there. I think we were very much, you know, at the time of OK Computer, I remember 1997 was the year, well, for instance, at all the award ceremonies that year, there was, there was us and The Verve. The Verve had uh, um, Urban Hymns, great album. And I think, you know, we were kind of like, Oasis had, you know, they were on their third album. They hadn't quite done what they'd done on their, brilliant first two records so they'd already established themselves as a massive thing but the, the up and coming ones were us and the verve and uh we sort of got into that kind of i don't know that kind of indie compilation land do you know what i mean and it's and you know g greatest guitar indie song you know that kind of territory and i think what, what was brilliant about kid a was that that left turn there was it left people behind it left some people behind but the people who stayed with us they were like fuck oh okay i'm a bit surprised by this but do you know what on the fourth listen of this i totally get it and and um i think as a band what we were always trying to do even with um the bends and okay computer because they were different from the previous records you're trying to take people on a musical journey if you like and that trust between the listener and the band my favorite albums with the band so i remember for instance an album for me uh the so i was a big u2 fan in the early days love boy october war and they were kind of like big guitar band and then they made this record called the unforgettable fire which was the eno landmark record and it was very ambient and and i'd never heard anything like that really i i, I hadn't delved in i wasn't awake to eno's previous work or you know i knew talking heads but i didn't understand you know his, his ambient stuff and I heard this record and I was like, oh, this isn't very like War. This is a bit like, you know, and there's sort of kind of like some musical moments on there that are just almost like jams and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But after about three, four listens, it became like my favorite album. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of journey I think that we were hoping that to build up that trust with your, with your people who like your music. You know. Which is unusual these days because we live in a very instant culture, you know, where one wrong tweet and you're over, you yeah. know, one wrong track and everyone moves on to another band. So actually, it's a, lux it's a luxury position where you can take those gambles. Whereas in like the 1960s, the Beatles did go on that trip and they took people completely over there. And maybe Pink Floyd did it to a certain extent in the 70s till they got very comfortable. But it's very rare for bands to basically fuck with the formula. I mean, it's a great position to be in. Yeah, and it's I, but as you said, it's a great position to be in. So if you're there, why don't why don't you do it? You do it. You know, mm -hmm. you you know, you you you. It makes it all more interesting, and and you should never be scared of, you know, losing people. You should also trust that. I think the thing is never to get arbitrary. Never do it for the sake of it. You do. It, it's got to be kind of playful, but at the heart of it, you've got to have the confidence to what you're doing, or you, as a band, that what you're doing is musically. You're, you're getting, I always say this, when you, when you're, you know when you're in the right place, when you're making the kind of music that you want to hear. And if you do that, however different it is from what you've done before, I think you trust that, that, that if you're into it, then other people, there will be some people who get into it as well. So for you yourself, has your role in the band changed over the years? You know, it's... Um... I think what was reading somewhere that you're like uh, the mum of the band or something, the, the one that kind of holds it together, the glue, which is such an important role in a group. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I was... I think, as well, what you put into the group, does that change over the years? Or is it roughly the same roles? I think the thing is, 
it'll be interesting to see what happens next because I think what happens, uh, you know, because we was formed at school, it's like it's got these almost like these deep roots from school, which gives it great strength. But also, you know, for instance, like I always felt like, I, you know, like I was, I am the mum of the band, and and that's great. But that's also, uh, you know, that's also slightly, you know, as you get older, you also want to try different roles. You want to try different things. So I think what, what we have to do in the next round is, is, is to try and find a way of being, flex, you know, that maybe that those roles aren't, I don't know, who knows. But I think that, that, that yeah, I mean, I don't think my role has changed that much from the beginning, no. <laughs> No, I think that we're bad. There's a thing when you're 16, 17, that's it. The shape is there. It fluctuates slightly, but it doesn't really yeah. change. Creatively, though, it may change. Does your role yeah. creatively change as it goes along? Do you, uh, are you relied on for bringing different parts, different sounds, different ideas in? Or has or that stayed the same as well? I think it's stayed the same, really. I mean, you know, the, 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 my role has, has always been to, or at least... Yeah, no, it has always been is to serve the, serve the songs, you know, um, to uh, to to serve essentially Tom's songs, Tom's lyrics. So, and to bring color and to bring sonic. So, I think, um, yeah, I don't know. It's always been that way so so far. But I think one of the things I actually really enjoyed about my process is not having to flip and do that all the time. You know, because inevitably. Oh. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because you can get bored of that stuff. I think that's the thing is like you can get bored of playing the same role. So for me, playing a rhythm, acoustic guitar, I played, you know, doing a song, a thing that Tom would traditionally done. I really get off on that. It's it, mm -hmm. to me, it's, you know, I mean, I'm speaking the obvious, but it's all about new experiences. Mm -hmm. It's all about how can you, how can I do something new? How, how can I have a new experience? And also uh, as hard as it is to admit, but the, the reality is, is where's, where, where, am I, where, where am I out of my comfort zone? Because if, mm. if I'm out of my comfort zone, that's the right place to be. Mm. Yeah, which is a great place for art, isn't it? So, but, but that role of adding colour to the songs is a really crucial role. Because I think, going back to the Beatles and the Stones as well, for me personally, when they were at both those bands were at their peak, is when the George Harrison and the Brian Jones were bringing in the sitar, the Mellotron, mm -hmm. weird little guitar bits, turning good songs into brilliant songs just by that little piece of colour. It may be two minutes into the song, they haven't done anything, and suddenly that thing comes in, you go, wow, what was that? It goes up another level. So it's, it's a key role, and it's not... I, th I think I mean, when people describe that role, it sounds like they're being modest, but I think it, it makes the song a lot of the time. Yeah, I, th I, th I think what's interesting, I mean, you know, and I'm not the only one who does it, because Johnny does that as well, obviously. So I think... I think for me, it's, it's often like that sound often looked at, it's like framing a song emotionally. You know, a song or a melody or a sound can bring in an emotion or give something a bit of depth. And, you know, certainly for me, why do I end up doing this? Because I've always been fans of that myself. Like you said, like George Harrison, I love George Harrison's guitar parts. I love, you know, Brian Jones, what he did. I mean, I, I love the Stones as well when Mick Taylor was in the Stones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a different dynamic. But, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I, I totally agree with you. And, and, and you know, I'm a fan of... Uh, I, I always... And it's lucky because I always grew up, you know, a lot of the guitarists and stuff that I did. Like, you know, Johnny Marr uh, was... He, he was an example of an extraordinary guitarist and a layering guitarist. He used to do all those sounds. Um, i a big fan of Will Sargent of the Bunnymen. Again, mm -hmm. used to do that. And they weren't, it's interesting as well with him and The Edge, when you think about you two and the early, those two bands, they weren't doing, they weren't song songs. They were more like, in a way, seemed to be more influenced by that kind of repetition or that kind of thing, that drive of almost like Noi or like that kraut rock thing. And they're creating atmospheres and there's this kind of momentum to the songs. And I, I always loved that. But also people like um, John McGeer of the magazine and and Susie and the Banshees. Mm. It was a great great time, you know, to be a to be a kid listening to this music and then picking up a guitar, because of course there's a technology there with effects pedals, which is effectively your arsenal. Mm. Um, 
and it's and 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 then the influences of, of people all these guitarists and musicians and people like Eno as well hugely influential on me about the way that they kind of they 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 frame music and they sculpt it and stuff like that so yeah i i you know it is we all stand on the shoulders of giants yeah so it's great he talked about john mcgeoch what an incredible guitar player amazing right i mean what you know i loved his stuff and when he joined public image limited when he joined pill and he did that disappointed and all that stuff and he was in that band armory show with richard jobson mm. and i everything that mcgeoch was in he brought something he was my favorite susie period obviously amazing in magazine but he's like he's like one of these almost he's, he's not forgotten because i know people like johnny marr they revered people like mcgeoch but he was he was amazing right Mm. He was 17 when he joined magazine. <laughs> wow. Was he from Manchester? He's from Glasgow and he was down here. Maybe he was 18. He was at college here. And he, was, a... he rented a room in Malcolm Garrett's house, you know, the d designer. And yeah. Malcolm knew Devoto and Howard said, I'm looking for guitar players. He said, I've got this kid who's good who lives in my house. And that's how he started. <laughs> yeah. Wow. He was kid wow. guitar player. It's interesting because his role and Will Sargent's role is, is like supposed to to your role, that thing, adding that magic, adding that little piece of colour into the song. And Johnny Marvish talked about, I, to me, he's different. Johnny actually writes a song and adds the, uh, the colour. He the does it all. At the same time, yeah. Which is, what, totally you, which is what you're we, doing now, isn't it, in a sense? Exactly. Yeah. I'm living out my Johnny, Marr, uh, my Johnny Marr fantasies by, you know, having the upfront riff and then being colour it, you know, beyond. And, you know, it's... I mean, it's great. I love being in Radiohead, obviously, but it's so nice having the freedom, having this palette to go like, I'll do a bit of this, bit of that. I, I really, um, it's, it's, and it's good for me as a musician, you know, it stretches me. So, yeah. You said uh, another, something to me I was reading that when you, when you were having your dark period, that you were speaking to Johnny, that helped you, uh, Johnny Marr, that helped you lift you out of that period. Yeah, Johnny's, I mean, I met, so I met Johnny when I had, we had an incredible, I had an ex incredible experience. Neil Finn invited a load of us uh, down, load of musicians down to New Zealand in 2001. Neil had this album, great album out called One Nil. And he invited Philip from our band, myself, Johnny Marr, Eddie Vedder, Sebastian Steinberg, who's bass player in Soul Coughing, Lisa Germano, who's a solo artist and a romantic, played with a lot of great musicians. And um, we did this, we did these gigs. And Neil said to me, he said, oh, listen, because um, he was going to a, a event, he was, I think initially he was going to, Wendy and Lisa were going to do it because uh, he'd done the album with them. And uh, Wendy, uh, is it Wendy who's the guitarist? Yeah, Wendy Melvin. Melvin. Is she the guitarist? Oh, sorry, I'm really, yeah, really yeah. bad on this. Anyway, she couldn't make it, or they couldn't make it. And Neil said, oh, I bumped into Johnny Ma the other day for what I really Johnny. And I was like, I was like, that initial thing of like, oh, fuck. He's like my guitar hero. And like, it was a big moment for me. And, and the first, and, and, and I was sort of, you know, I, I, it was a, it was a, of course it's an amazing thing to play with a hero, but also you never know what they're going to be like. And mm. sometimes as I say, it's quite good not to meet your heroes because you can sort of, and, uh, I was on, it was, so it, it, it happened down in New Zealand and I was on the plane from the second leg or the third leg from Sydney to Auckland. And I got on and Johnny and his wife, Angie were there and Johnny immediately Johnny and Angie immediately were like so warm. There was no standoffishness. It was just like, and I think we talked the whole way over the Tasman Sea. And he was like, and it was great because um, I think it was an important period for both of us. And he knew because he'd read in, in a guitar inter a guitarist interview that I'd done. I'd basically said that I talked about all my influences, but I said of all of them, Johnny Mann, someone in his management send this to him when he'd had pneumonia. And he said it had really, you know, He'd taken note of it. So he knew I was a big Smiths fan. So we had this incredibly rich, we're thrown together, all of us, for two weeks. So it's a kind of heightened emotion. We've got to let Neil's like, and everyone's throwing in songs. Like we probably learned about 55, 60 songs in, in five days rehearsal. Then we got five gigs to do. 
and so it's very heightened you kind of you you sort of, all your senses but for me hanging out with not only Johnny but Neil's a great one but for him he's he was like a real sometimes you need role, you need people who who kind of maybe a few years ahead of you and i was having doubts about you know I'm, this whole rock and roll thing and bands thing it can be such a cliche and you know I, 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 our kids hadn't been born, but I met with my wife and I was thinking, how am I going to balance the family and all of this? Anyway, meeting people like Johnny and Neil, seeing what beautiful kids and the way they were doing it and the way their families were central to what they were doing and the way they balanced it. And they've been, they've been like older brothers to me. Johnny's been like an older brother to me, really has. And he kind of validated, I was very insecure, but he validated what I did. And we had these, you know, I mean, you know, he, I think he wanted to talk, as well to somebody who'd been in a band about the Smiths. And we talked a lot about the Smiths, which he hadn't spoken about at that time. And there was a lot of stuff that he wanted to do as well. So we, we talked a lot about stuff and, you know, I just love him as, you know him obviously. And, yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. one of your heroes to be such a, he listens like so many people never listen. He's one of these people who really listens to people and he's so generous of his time and his spirit and his, he's, He's, he's got, he's street and he's got an edge, but he's also very kind and he's got this fantastic sort of, he's got this amazing energy. So yeah, he's a very, very important person to meet along the way for me. Encyclopedic knowledge of music. Any style oh. of music, he knows it inside out as well, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. And what, what a player. I mean, it's such a joy playing guitar with him. I mean, it's just like, you know, I was always, I was, I was always thinking, I was thinking if, if ever the Smiths got together, maybe I could be that Craig Gannon. I, Johnny would call me up and said, do you want to come along and, you know, be that, the other guitarist? <laughs> I think it'd probably be more fun playing with uh, Johnny as, as, as Johnny Marr. I wouldn't want it. That was 15 years ago. Yeah. I wouldn't want to play, do that now. Not with Morrissey. I would, definitely with Johnny, not with, not with the Moz. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think uh, Morrissey probably needs Johnny to have a little word in his ear more than anybody. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Just relax and enjoy it, for fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, just moving on to lockdown periods. I mean, this, this is odd because, especially for you, because the, the record comes out in this really bizarre time. So I guess it completely kiboshed virtually all the plans you had for what you're going to do with the record. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, you know, that's... Uh, people have said, oh, it's, is it, it is what it is. You know, we know this thing is bigger than anything we've ever come across. So you have to adapt. And that's the important thing. And I've, I, you know, there was never a question of not releasing it. It's, it felt like the, the right move to bring out. So yeah, the key thing now is to, is to, yeah, adapt to a new world. I mean, how, how are you adapting to this world? Um, well, I've had the virus, so that's kind of not me it? a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I had it. I got it about five weeks ago and I'm, it's taking a while to recover. So, uh, I'm a bit tired. I thought this week, like I said to you in an email, I said, I'll be writing this week. I got up at 6.30 on Monday morning this week and I, I just felt shit. I felt really bad again. So I'm just, I'm just for the first time I, I'm, I'm learning now. I'm like, okay, I'm taking it easy. So I'm um, doing a lot of interviews, which is great. I can do this and doing a bit more kind of stuff on social media, but I, I'm still kind of in promo mode with the record because we can do interviews, but it will change. And I think, you know, uh, I, th I have a feeling we might be in this kind of this mode for a while, you know, mm -hmm. lockdown easing lockdown. This virus is probably not going to go away for a while. So I think, um, I think the key thing is to, to be respectful, be a good, you know, be a good citizen. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not like, I hope you can tell I'm not like, I'm not somebody who worries about my career. It's like, if anything, it's, it's like, I try and intuitively work my way through things like this. And hopefully this will be a good opportunity to write some more music. And that's what I'm hoping. But as I've learned from this week, I'm, I'm getting my ass kicked a bit, like expecting this to happen. It's not going to, it'll happen if it happens and it might not happen. So mm. I'll end up reading a load of books. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you think the role of a musician is? Say what the ro role of you and, and a Radiohead as well in these times? Is it, I mean, obviously the heroes of these times, the frontline staff and the NHS, of course, that's, this is not what yeah. we're talking about here. 
but there is a role for musician because I had this thing you think, God, we're, we're useless, aren't we? I can't even drive. What can we do in these yeah. times? And then you start thinking, yeah. maybe we do have a role. Maybe, maybe there is some, and maybe putting on your FAC hat here. What, what is the role of musician in the lockdown? I think the role of musician, and I've always felt it, and I think it's even more so, and is of service. We're serving people. Like I've always said this, like people go, oh, this is, you know, you know, you guys are amazing or you're amazing. I said, listen, 100 years ago, or 200 years ago, 200 years ago, I'm a musician. I'm traveling around on donkey or horseback from town to town. <laughs> it's only because of modern culture that there's a spotlight and we can, be, we can be sort of teleported into people's homes or into their lives. So I think it's what it's always been. Music is a really important part of people's lives. We're not frontline workers, as you say. It's not life and death, but we can help people. And we can help elevate people. We can help people process stuff. Music helps, certainly helps people process stuff. You know, melancholic music allows you to be melancholic, to be tearful, to cry. But that helps you to process. So for me, I've always seen music as, you know, is my role is to be of service. My initial role when I'm writing and recording is to be of service to the song. And then when the music is done, it's of service to those people who want to hear it. And it, I, I, I feel like, yeah, that's, 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 that's our role. So um, have you been immersed in culture much in the last few weeks? I imagine you've probably spent quite a lot of time just lying in bed flat out <laughs> with the, uh, the hideous virus. But has there been like times when you've been listening to music? And if so, do you find yourself revisiting music from a long time ago, where it's, what is a, a warmer, golden memories than there is in this current time? Or are you just going headlong into the future in this time as well, or both? A bit of both, really. I mean, I haven't really listened to much. I've spent more time. I've had, I've, to be honest, I've had more. I've had more peace just when these moments I'm feeling good, like watering the plants in the garden. I've discovered this joy of the garden. I, you know, um, and seeing that everything, it, you know, we've got this incredible weather and things are blooming. And I, I'd never, I've never done this before. I've never watched plants on a daily basis. The buds, you know, when we arrived, when we got, when we started this, everything was nothing was blooming and now everything's shooting up and I, you know, I know it's such a cliche, but that's, I'm being knocked out by that. But musically, there are only two things to listen to. The first thing I listened when I got better, because I can't listen to music when I'm ill. I'm sort of more like I read a book or, or um, yeah, the first thing I listened to, I listened to Nick Drake and, and that was the first thing I, was, I, I cooked a roast. And it was just like, it was, a, it was one of these beautiful Sunday afternoons. And I listened to both his records and I was just like, ah, oh, this, that felt right. So that's obviously something in the past that I love. And the, the, the only new music I've listened to is the Laura Marling album, which is obviously steeped in, it's the modern record, but it's obviously, again, quite folky. So I'm kind of interested. I've been talking to people like, I wonder if people's music, tastes are going to change if is this lockdown going to affect people is this going to i think it's certainly going to affect the way people write musicians write i mean and is it but is this going how is this i must see this is early days in this really you know probably or maybe not maybe this is you know we're we're well into it but but how is it going to change the way are people listening you know i know the drake record was dropped is the Drake record still resonating? I don't know. I'm interested. You know, I'm, that, how is this going to affect us as as listeners and as as creators? I think uh, one thing I'm seeing is a lot of people working, and me personally, and probably a lot of people you know as well. Everybody's working on laptops and sending music around to each other. So the yeah. older model, which is not a dead model, but at the moment you can't do it. But everyone's standing in a rehearsal room trying to make sense of a song. It's changing, isn't it? So you, you, can, you can sit here writing a song with somebody in Tokyo, which I know people have done before this, but it's accelerated in this period. Yeah. There's, there's less choice, isn't there? And I think yeah. people are taking chances because, well, the, is anybody out there? It doesn't, like, you, like when you made your solo record, it doesn't really matter. You make what's there. And there's less pressure. Yeah. The, the, the older models are making music broken down. And I think also because the live circuit, no one knows when it's going to come back. So people think of different ways of how, how are you going to play music and get it to people? Yeah. And it's going to be one of the last things that come back, isn't it? Like live music concerts. I mean, these are places where, and it, oh, what's, what's going to be interesting is, you know, you're going to have to build up the confidence of the public to actually go to gigs. You mm -hmm. know, I know there are a lot of people who are very, I think what, 
you know, there are some people who are very, who hope, you know, who are thinking we're going to go back to the old ways. Well, that's not going to happen. And, you know, people are, you know, obviously putting back tours, but they're putting back to, you know, perhaps the, the autumn of this, of this year. But are people really going to be confident again of going? I, I mean, it's going to take a lot of trust and, a, you know, you're going to have to have the all clear for, for a while, I would think, for people to, to really want to do that. Yeah, to see how clear the all clear actually is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so have you been there uh, reading a lot? I mean, there's, uh, there's plenty of books behind you, but... Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I read, I've been reading, I've finally been re- getting through Thoreau's Walden. I felt mm-hmm. like that was a really good book to read, you know, on Walden Pond, finally get him to, because it's a very, again, he basically goes into self-isolation for a year. So, um, and... I've been sort of dipping in and I found, I found this, uh, this book and it's, and I found it in a hotel in Portugal about four years ago and very naughtily, I, it was this hotel. I took it and I left another book, but I was, it, it was called, it was called the end of civilization and the seeds of the future. And it's written by this American with a German name. And he's, He's one of these, obviously, you know, people 20 years ago are going to call him a, like a crank because he's like, but basically it's a very dense book and it's a, he's basically saying what's going on now. And what's interesting is, and, you know, I've been, I've been certainly, I'm sure like many of us, I've been feeling that we're in a crisis and I, I didn't see a pandemic, but definitely I've thought in our lifetime, we were, we're moving towards uh, an environmental crisis, some huge environmental event that would force us to change. Well, you know, mm-hmm. pandemic has, 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 has been that. doesn't mean that something environmental won't happen, but I've re- been reading that book. So that's kind of interesting and about, it's quite anthropological and also has a balance of, you know, of the future of how we might as a society function um in the future so yeah i've um and uh i'll probably yeah i've got uh, i'm not really into novels at the moment i'm not it has to be the last great novel i read read was um the overstory by richard powers which is an incredible book probably the best novel i've read in the last 10 years and i finished that just after christmas but i'm reading a sort a lot of yeah other stuff so it's less of um trying to escape and more trying to make sense of, of the time. Yeah, and I love. I'm very into kind of esoteric stuff as well. There's a there's a there's an old there's a, a kind of an, the Aldous Huxley of America is a guy called Manly P. Hall, and there's this book up there called The Secret Teachings of All Ages, and it's about this old knowledge. So I'm interested in a lot of the old knowledge, and also reading things like you know the old texts like Gilgamesh. I read the Odyssey. Uh, a, a really good translation of it um things that kind of i don't know things that feel appropriate now because they're steeped in the past or that they're, they're steeped in there's some kind of inherent wisdom in the writings that that are appropriate now you know it's i'm not really interested in the, the the froth of you know the the tittle tattle of modern life i'm 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 more interested in to like books that somehow tie into what it means to be a human being on this planet at the moment and people have been writing about this stuff for thousands of years so i'm interested in 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 that kind of stuff and have you been um watching much tv or you a box set person films or no i, I haven't watched anything no hmm. i I've, we watched on my birthday which is last week the others have been watching stuff the others in the family but i am um, only one film, and I introduced the kids to, you know, Being There by P- with Peter Sellers. Well, the greatest uh, film. Yeah, yeah d- d- directed by Hal Ashby, who's just one of the great, he did Harold and Moore, didn't he? Like mm. a really amazing director. And I just love that film. I saw it in the cinema with my dad when it came out. My dad took me, and we had a real bonding moment. And I, yeah, so I'm, Being There is the only thing I've seen. And it felt really good. It felt really appropriate, you know. That, that, that simple character, Chauncey Gardner, and, and it's just a beautiful film. Well, a simple character gets into running the whole of America. <laughs> it's beautiful, and, and it's just so, it is his finest role. I think it's definitely his finest role. It's, it's amazing. Subtext of it, because he's actually meant to be like a messiah type figure. It's actually 
uh, allegory on Jesus Christ, isn't it? Yeah, totally. So yeah, he's walking on the water, don't he? So in the end, you go, wow, he's actually far smarter than he's letting on. And it's just, <laughs> but it makes the name a bit of Stan Laurel as well, where the clown has the wisdom. So yeah. On one level, you kind of go, look, any any stupid person could be the president, but that isn't actually what it's about. I like that. I like that little twist in it. Yeah, yeah I totally love that. And I love those, that, that was an era when directors were making films like that. Hal Ashby, when you look at what he directed, he didn't direct a whole load. But what he did direct was just beautiful. And he was just making great stories with lots of depth to it. Mm. Mm. Bit like, bit like records, making records. Yay! <laughs> <laughs>